Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another episode of Local Chat. It's actually episode 68, so close to nice, but we're <sighs> not quite there. It is going to be a fantastic episode because One Will Crosby is not here, and yes, he did dump this in my lap about 90 minutes ago when I was in the middle of a grocery store. But folks, we're going to make it because we have two other fantastic Subpixel members here. Jake, how's it going, buddy? I'm good. You also, you you messaged me when I was in the middle of a grocery store and I yeah. couldn't get any service to respond to you until I got home. But the, um, yeah, we're here. We pulled we're it together. The, 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 uh, the anchor of this episode, the person who did not have to change roles and was never in doubt is, of course, Kyle. <laughs> How's it going, Kyle? It's going good. I, I have not stepped in a grocery store at all today, so maybe that's it. It's just... Oh, that could be. <laughs> I, I, um, I didn't want to go today. But I ran out of milk like three days ago and I'm running out of bread and I'm out of like cereal. So every time I make coffee, I can't put any milk in it and stuff. And I'm just like, damn it, I've got to go get, get some good grocery shopping today. You know, it just happens. There are happen. some people Ian, who eat their cereal without milk. You're de- OK, uh, Jake, can you people terrorists? Yeah. Can you describe <laughs> for us real quick, Jake, which, how you eat your cereal uh, with no milk? It's just dry in the bowl. I, and but, can you can you tell us what childhood trauma led you to that sort of lifestyle? Yeah, I just don't want it to be soggy. I think it's like nasty. I want to be clear. Wet grains. I have nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with dry cereal. I eat dry cereal occasionally. What creeped me out during our Iceland trip was when Jake <laughs> pulled up to breakfast with a bowl full of cereal and a spoon, but there was no milk in it. That's how he was eating his dry cereal. That's the offensive part. So for me, the only time I eat cereal dry is if it's like Fruit Loops. Yeah. And mm. you don't, I don't have a spoon for that. You just, you pick with your fingers. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. like the only time. Exactly. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's talk about the games we've been playing. Let's kick it off with uh, Kyle. How's your uh, game get gaming gaming history for, talk about the games being played it's, it's been good i beat elden ring Yay. i am the elden lord so um i actually did that like a week ago but um it was it was great i logged i think it was 127 hours i was level 170 something Oof. but you didn't have to um, cut off your own arm no um hmm. no i i did not have to do that Oh, I get um, it. Maybe, maybe for my second playthrough. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It took me a um, while, but I got it. I'm <laughs> wait, there. is that a? Is that a? Yeah, it's the um, the um, Ashton Kutcher movie. Is he in that? No, it's no. Franco. <laughs> it's James Franco. Oh, James Franco. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought I thought you were making a joke about the the second boss. Is it Godric or whatever? Who, no, like, I was making a joke. Oh, you said 127 right, hours. He's crafted. Yes, that's yeah. right. I forgot about that the, moment. The motion picture, 127 hours, but the guy who gets his arm stuck in the rock. While oh, I, he's climbing. I didn't even. I've never actually seen that. I love. Nor Daniel have Lord. I. I've never. I've never seen it. It's okay. It also it has James Franco, so it's like watching a Kevin Spacey movie where it's just yeah, it's yeah, always like, in the, always in the background. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're yeah. allowed to do it. Just don't talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> be like well i watched it before i want to be clear i'm talking about watching kevin spacey movies not doing what (laughs) kevin spacey is accused of okay (laughs) i just want to be very clear on that sure um so don't tell us sorry i derailed the elden ring discussion no it's all right i i um look we all know elden ring is already on the subpixel 2022 game of the year contention list so don't give us your end all be all but just overall, what are your thoughts on Elden Ring now that you've kind of wrapped it up? Um, I thought it was, and I mean this in the in the in the best possible way. Mm-hmm. I was, I was. It's not often that I find myself being in a mindset where I think about a game all day, um, and whenever I'm not playing a game, I think about playing the game. That doesn't often happen because normally for me, playing a game is like I'm at work. Like mm-hmm. yeah, I come back and it's like, okay, this is a nice way to relax for the, th- the month and a quarter, you know, that I played Elden Ring. I was almost thinking about it constantly where I was like, I just need to get past this next part. I just need to get through this next section. Um, and it, it sort of was in percolating in the back of my brain for the entirety of my playthrough. Not many games have ever done that to me. I think maybe Skyrim 
Breath of the Wild, um, probably like Fallout 3 when it first came out. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I get that it's funny because those are all like open world games. Um, but I, I do like open world games a lot. Um, and then also Inscription, although Inscription only took place between like, it only took me like two days to beat it. So it was a very yeah. short period. Um, but I was thinking about it constantly. Uh, so it, it definitely finds itself in my mind among the very short list of games that have, that have taught me like that. And, uh, I thought it was fun it was challenging it was a new experience for me being the first from soft game i've ever played from beginning to end mm-hmm. um and yeah i i think by the end i was i was tired but but satisfied of the amount of time that i had spent inside that world but it was definitely like i need a break yeah <laughs> like I need I need to stop playing this because 100, 120, 130 hours is a lot of time to do that. And uh, it it satisfied me uh, mentally and uh, not so much emotionally, but definitely like my I, I felt like I grew as a player through my through my entire play. So I was I was very satisfied with that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and this other game belongs in that pantheon of games that you can't stop thinking about and that will stay with you a long time. Is that right? Um, not so much, (laughs) but (laughs) But I did um, notice it's on the list. It was off the list for a while, but it's come back. It was, it was off the list because I had beaten the like story, like, like Mm -hmm. the main story I had finished. And I had a bunch of, um, additional DLC missions that are like, they're like beefy DLC missions, but not entire like eight hour lengths. It's like, yeah, you can spend like an hour doing like one DLC mission or and I had, I think, like 12 of them that yeah. came along with one of the DLCs. And it was always just in the back of my mind. I was like, I, I have to I have to clear my quest list. Um, so I have two quests left in the entire game. And then I'm completely done. Uh, this is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. If you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I have logged more hours in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, 134 hours, than I have in Elden Ring. Oh and my Elden gosh. Ring, even though it was only like an eight, hour to nine hour difference um assassin's creed felt about five times as long <laughs> because there's just no variety it's just like yeah. fetch quest fetch quest fetch quest fight a monster fetch quest fetch quest sail to this place fetch quest fetch. It, like elden ring at least has enough variety that it's it keeps it interesting and you're constantly you know changing your play style based on what weapons you get assassin's creed i actually tried this out last night i'm so strong in assassin's creed if you just hit the bumper, the right bumper button, which is just your main attack, and you just close your eyes, you will win every combat scenario you find yourself in. <laughs> wow. Just like look away for like a minute and then look back and it's like, okay, I won. And that's that's not fun. <laughs> so, uh, But some part of my brain was like, you have to finish this because you need to get your full $60 or I think I paid like 30 bucks for it. But um, yeah, so not not nearly as much fun as <laughs> Elden Ring. And it was also a nice comparison. Because Elden Ring is, it's very movement based and, and it's, uh, you can be very fluid once you learn the combat system and the, and the movement system. Assassin's Creed felt like I was jumping into like a, um, like a wave rider game where mm-hmm. it's just like you press left and you, like you jerk yeah. to like the next yeah. thing. It felt like that um, when it's a full open world game with like full, you know, 360 combat, but it still felt very stilted and very like, narrow and that that change i didn't realize while i was playing it for the main part but coming back from elden ring it was like holy crap this is like real bad (laughs) like this is rough but yeah that's crazy those are my those are my two games but yeah i i would recommend maybe 30 hours of assassin's creed odyssey don't do 100 past that don't (laughs) yeah i i've been i wouldn't say thinking about replaying or playing any of those games, but it's just a weird Maggie listens to a lot of history podcasts. And one of the podcasts she listens to, I have only listened to the intro of it. Because what she does is she plays it off her phone, she puts it in a little seashell fanny pack, and then she walks around the house or the garden and it's just yeah. blaring these podcasts all the time. And one of them is one of them is a podcast called Ragnarok. And oh. it is a podcast sponsored completely by Ubisoft. Because it's a tie-in to the Assassin's Creed uh, Valhalla, Valhalla Ragnarok 
expansion. And I'm just like, this is very weird. This like full blown history podcast completely funded and sponsored by Ubisoft because it historically kind of relates to Assassin's Creed. And so it just has Assassin's Creed on my head because I hear Assassin's Creed like three or four times a day now. I don't know. Just one of those weird wonder, promotional ties. I wonder if that's like a like a tax write off for them. But they're like, oh. oh, if we make a portion of this game educational or whatever, like we can. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Either that or it screams like, hey, we have this budget and we didn't actually hit the budget. So we need to spend <laughs> this money somehow. So we keep, we keep getting this budget next year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that also makes sense. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jake, let's talk about the games mm. you've been playing. Yeah. So I'm in like kind of a um, minimalist game mood or have mm -hmm. been for a while because I have a, I have a couple of games that I have purchased that I I really want to dive into but I want to like make sure I have the like the time to devote to them because I don't really want to like like I keep meaning to play Horizon Forbidden West but I don't want to play that in like one or two hour chunks at a time I want to kind of be able to sit with it for a bit yeah um, so I've been playing um, a game from I want to say maybe even like four or five years ago called Mini Metro that I can't remember if I've talked about on here at all. Um, it's think so. essentially like a subway planning game mm -hmm. where little stations. It's all like presented, you know, like you're looking at a map on a subway when you go to a subway, and it's just yeah. you know colored lines, and you have to match Six up inch, the tracks. Twelve inch and, Italian cut, yeah. yeah. And it's, um, you know, shapes will appear at the station and then the, yeah. the, there's a shape station and you, you know, make sure everybody and it's nice and it's charming. It has a um, uh, a score by disaster piece, kind of, because it's um, I don't know if algorithmically generated is the right word, but disaster piece wrote melodies and motifs that will begin to layer on one another as the complexity of the subway kind of evolves. Mm -hmm. So it'll start and it'll be like, you know, just a couple of little notes. And then as you get more, you might get, you know, another instrument comes in. Um, so it's also interesting from that angle um, as someone who's semi-musical. I think, um, I think I've played this game a little bit. I, I think what really struck me was that it, it is very minimal. But mm -hmm. it's also very fluid. Like, it's not like, mm -hmm. oh, you beat this level. Here's the next level. Like, it just pops in a new station or pops in new people. And it just kind yeah. of flows the progression through it. And that felt very, very nice. nice. Yeah. Minimal, very peaceful. Like, minimalism, not just in art, but also in, like, design and in flow and progression and user experience, etc. Yeah. It's very good. And I, th I got it for, like, four bucks on the Switch or something. You should nice. buy it. Um. This is not sponsored by. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think the studio is Subway. Dinosaur Polo Club. <laughs> That's um, a good name. Or like that it. may be the people who ported it to the Switch. I can't remember if they're the original studio or not, because originally it was on Steam. Um, and then I almost bought the Mario Kart Track DLC, and then I didn't. Yeah, I've been thinking about it too. Like I do love Mario Kart, oh. but I, I just, I think honestly, I think. One of us will have to buy it for extra life this year because this feels like a mm -hmm. great like two hour time waster. So let's just play oh, yeah. every single Mario Kart eight track at least once. That'll be fun. I, yeah. I thought for a second you were talking about the physical Mario Kart racetrack thing. Oh, the oh, RC no. and I was really thing. excited. I thought I thought that's what you were talking about. No, sorry. No, the um but it's it's I still am a little bit confused about how the Switch online membership works because it's you have to buy that to buy the track the track DLC come free if you have the online membership i don't know uh, i, I got was, kind I of perplexed by the store page i'm not sure either i thought it was a discount i don't I know i can't remember it was confusing enough that i got to the landing page on the eShop and was like i'm not figuring this out right now yeah i don't want to deal yeah. with it yeah yeah that's too much. Anything else you've been you playing? You basically just summed up all of Nintendo's online. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, I don't know I don't how this deal works. With this. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I still play Islanders from time to time because it's I, that's like my comfort game now. That's your RimWorld. I'm just going to play. Yeah, I'm just going to play Islanders. I'm going to build a little city. Cool. 
let my people live. You just got so ha your face just like got serene. When you said that. it's nice. <laughs> it's it is. It's very cozy. It's wholesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cozy's the right word. Um, I like Jake. I my gaming for the past week has also been minimalist in that I have been playing one game and one game only. I think I picked it up. I picked it up Thursday night last week. I'm talking about Gran Turismo 7. I've been wanting to play it since it came out, but but the way it happened was it came out, I think, like two days before I went on my cruise, and I was like, I don't want to pick it up, start playing it, and then put it back down for a week and come back. And also, I was still kind of dicking around with Elden Ring at the time. Then I finished Elden Ring, but it was, at that point, Gran Turismo 7 didn't have a lot of pr good press because they were like, <laughs> hey, there's real bad monetization, and it's online only, and they were down for 26 hours yesterday in a maintenance period that went wrong. And I was like... Oh, no. So I was kind of like hesitant and I was like, well, maybe I'll wait for it to go on sale because it's basically it's it's 60 slash 70 bucks, whether you get PS4, or PS5 version. But uh, let's just put it. I, I work's been tough. And last Thursday, Maggie and I, we went out to dinner and I had last Friday off and I was just like, fuck it treating myself <laughs> and we went to Target and I bought myself Grand Turismo 7 and folks it's real good it's mm. real good there's a lot of bad press and honestly some of it is justified but at the end of the day that game still feels good now before i dive into some of these details do you guys have any experience with grand Turismo? uh i believe on the original playstation Ooh. i don't know if that was one or two i think, I think maybe both i think one and two were yeah. both on there i think I, th the I think i've played two i think I think the only time I've touched the series was actually when it was as like a demo in like a Walmart or a Target yeah. or a GameStop or whatever. Um, and obviously you're like 15, 16, you're like craning your neck to look up at the old, <laughs> at least it used to be this way. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just thought I was like, okay, this is like a racing game. And I, I didn't understand what set it apart. So other than that, I've never played any racing sims or, or would this be considered a racing sim or a driving sim? Oh boy. So this is, um, there are varying schools of thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, I mean, uh, if, if there are varying schools of thought, they're all wrong. It, it's just a spectrum, <laughs> right? So, so on the far left hand side is basically like, like a need for speed game where it's okay. like super arcadey to the point where there is constant rubber banding and none of it feels real. And then on the far right hand side is something like iRacing or Assetto Corsa or R Factor, where it's like, no, this is 100% sim. This is when you start a race, your tires are cold and you will spin. And if you spin and hit the wall, you get penalized and it, you have to sit in the pits for 10 minutes while you tow before you can go back out. And it's like, I, I enjoy at least one end of that spectrum. Right. Mostly the realistic games, the arcade games I do enjoy as well, like because even something like a Mario Kart or a kart racer, I feel like is right in the middle of that spectrum, because even though it portrays itself as more arcade, arcade and has items, the driving still feels very good. And you, and you actually do have to know shortcuts and boosting and you do have to have some skill there. Um, so if you picture that skip, uh, that's that spectrum from like a one to ten, one being super arcade fake to like ten being super realistic. Gran Turismo 7, it's probably around like, it's probably around like an 8, honestly. Um, and, and the reason why we put it at an 8 is because not only is it trying to be realistic, it also feels very, very good. Um, and, and I like to play a lot of racing games more on the realistic side. And um, it's part of the reason why I've fallen off of the Forza series, both uh, Forza and Forza Horizon, because both of those games... They don't feel that good, and Horizon in particularly has like a really bad rubber banding issue, where yeah, like they were game of the year. Fuck <laughs> off, Jake. Look, it's like I feel like I've talked about this before, but like I'm not saying I'm an amazing racer, but I know enough about racecraft to tell when I am doing good versus doing bad, and to look at other people and tell when they're doing good versus bad. Like, oh, they screwed up that corner, or they're breaking too early, or they're breaking too late. And literally playing Forza Horizon, just watching the cars around you, you're like, why is that guy 10 seconds ahead of me? He is screwing up all over the place, you know? <laughs> or you're just like, why is that guy catching up to me? He is, he is not good. Like, they, you, can, you can basically see the computer be like plus 20 MPH to this guy for the next 10 seconds. It's, it's so funky. Um, but Gran Turismo 7 just feels very good. And it also has a lot of... Um, the way that it does assists allows you to change the difficulty 
And the way that they do that really makes it accessible. So for example, for me, I have most of the assist turn off except for traction control. So I don't have to worry about, you know, if I come through a, a corner and I nail down the throttle, I don't have to worry about spinning out because it'll literally modulate my throttle. So even if I'm saying 100%, it'll be like 25, 30, 35, 40. Okay, now I'll give you 100%. Otherwise, you're going to spin. Um, but you can turn on like anti-like brakes. You can turn on like auto braking. So if you're going into a corner and you're not braking enough, it'll brake further for you. Um, you can turn on a racing line. What I like to do instead is um, it just has little little like uh, almost like map markers, like Google map style map markers on the track to basically say, hey, you should touch this side of the track here. You should touch the corner here and then you should touch it here. So it kind of it's not a full line, but it's like you should be on the right side. You should be on the left side now. And so you can really dial it in. And the whole time it just feels fantastic. Like like I really enjoy racing. It feels like I am actually racing against even though I'm just doing AI. It feels like I'm actually catching up to them. And when I'm not, I'm making mistakes. Like when you nail a corner, it feels so good. They've got a nice mix of like really cool fictional tracks and realistic tracks that I've raced in other games. And like the end of the day, man, Gran Turismo 7, it just feels, it's just a really nice feeling re racer. You, it, you guys kind of have that feeling where you play a race game or any other game where it just feels like so well honed that you're just, you're in it. You don't feel like there's any obstacles between you and the game. Oh yeah. Need for Speed Hopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I I I do like racing games. I've just never played one. I've never played anything like a Forza or a. Um, do you think Do you think Gran Turismo Seven is a good starting point? Is there a game where he's like, you should go back and play this game if you want to learn, or is there like a That's, tutorial? Yeah, that's a really good segue. So so. The, the other thing that I really love about Gran Turismo 7 is the way that it treats car culture in the game. So most games are, you know, like I played Grid uh, Legends recently, and um, that game is just like, this is serious motorsports time. Like, you know, let's get down to a championship time. Or even like something like Forza Horizon is like, Yo, get your cool car, bro. Drive it across a field. Isn't that a cool Ferrari, bro? Look at this McLaren. Or something like um, Need for Speed Heat. Literally, within the first five minutes of Need for Speed Heat, it's like bro culture. It's all about underground. It's all about your JDM vehicle souped up going 120 down the highway and cops suck. And within like the opening cutscene of Need for Speed Heat, there's literally like a cop about to execute a street racer in public. And the only reason why he doesn't is because they're like, chief, there's a camera there. They're going to they're going to record it if you do it. And it's like really messed up. Like it's it's like this whole like. F the police like bro culture. It's all about screw pedestrians. Let's go fast on the street. Like there are different ways of taking car culture. And some of those really suck, honestly. And some of those are based on real life or have bled into real life, like Fast and Furious culture. And that just sucks. It really, those, those cultures suck. Gran Turismo 7, the main through line that they use to kind of take you through the game is a cafe. It's literally like a coffee and pastry cafe and it's just playing smooth jazz. And they're just like, and there's this guy named Luca and he's just like, Hey, <laughs> welcome to Gran Turismo seven. And he's like, Hey, go try out this race. And you go try out the race. And he's like, cool. Here's a reward for your next reward. How about you go collect three classic Supras here? You can race these. And you're like, do, 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 do. And there's what like, you're saying is, is it's exactly like real life. If you're living in Europe. Yes, and it's fantastic because the other thing is that like they celebrate cars, but it's not like the coolest car is twelve million dollars. It's like like one of the early ones they do is they're like, hey, we want you to collect three different Mini Coopers because the Mini Cooper, and then they explain it in like in like a minute long text cutscene. They're like, the Mini Cooper is a classic of like British and European racing, and it's like it started out as like as like a friendly budget car, but then people realized it was a really cool racer, and it's persisted to this day. So it's like teaching you this really nice friendly like clean history of cars and celebrating cars not because they're fast not because they're cool not because they're expensive but just as like a mechanical cultural item and that just oozes throughout the entire game the design the aesthetic the music um it's fantastic and it's it's just 
the way that they present that is very unique and very refreshing and honestly very positive for car culture compared to something like Fast and the Furious, which is just a bunch of assholes going, oh, you don't have a GTR, bro? Nice nice wheels bro what you do get fakes off ebay and it's like yeah i did get fakes off ebay because they're like a quarter of the price and i don't give a shit about brand buddy you know it's like so the other thing kyle i don't mean to keep going but there's one other thing here on talking turismo there's one other thing that gran turismo does really well i've talked about it before and it's perfectly to your question kyle there's a licensing system in gran turismo um, it's not super stringent in this because basically you can do like the first 10 races and then they're like, hey, to do this, you should do this championship next. And to do it, you need to get your first license level. And to do the license level, you literally go to this training center and they're like, you need to pass these seven tests to do your license. And they start out simple. They're things like, hey, you need to get from here to here and then hit the brakes and land within this box. And you have to do it within a certain amount of time. So it's like get from zero to 100 miles per hour and then stop within this box. And depending on your time, you pass the test or not. And then it gets to like, hey, here's a series of S curves. We're going to tell you how to do it. You can even watch a video of us doing it. And then you have a certain amount of time that you need to do it in. So it's like 10, 15, 20 second chunks of racing. And they tell you like, hey, here's a technique you need, you need how to learn. And now demonstrate it and prove you can do it. And then you get that pass that test towards your license and um i've talked about it before but like i have taken things that i've learned in gran turismo through that licensing system into not just my real life when i get a little bit hectic on the back roads but also into more serious sims like i racing when i've done several 24-hour endurance races using the techniques i have learned in gran turismo because they're accurate they apply both to real life and to more serious games so it's fantastic that system for teaching you like here's how to actually race a car at speed keep it under control but also not lose time and so yeah i gotta i gotta highly recommend it does that kind of answer your question yeah no i mean that sounds like a good sort of way to ratchet up someone's experience from nothing to like yeah. you need to reach this level to go forward and until you do like you need to keep trying it's kind of I'm, not to go back to Elden Ring, but it's basically like the Elden Ring thing where it's like yeah. there are tiered bosses where it's like you literally can't get past this point in the story unless you beat this boss. To do that, you need to yeah. try and try and try again. So I, I kind of, I mean, I like that. It sounds it sounds like something I would be interested in. It's it's one of those things where it's like, and it's been so long. And I've, I mean, I've got a controller, which I don't necessarily want to like play on a controller, but um. So I will I say play on a keyboard either. So. I I played Gran Turismo Sport on my wheel and pedals, and I was hoping to do that for seven. But long story short, my wheel and my pedal set are different manufacturers now, which is fine on the PC. It doesn't work on consoles anymore because the console won't accept yeah. two USB ports as a single input, basically. So I have to I have to use the controller for Gran Turismo Seven. It's fine. I, it's I, I, I don't know what they're doing because normally I'm awful at racing games with the controller, but I think they're doing some voodoo background magic with the analog stick and it just feels very, very smooth. Um, okay. So that obstacle that I usually have, not a problem. Um, but I, I can't wait for you to play it because, folks, I'm doing it. I, I thought I would. I wasn't sure because of the bad press, but I'm doing it. I'm putting Gran Turismo 7 on the Subpixel Game of the Year 2022 consideration oh it's fantastic we'll have to figure out how to do it i did i did a little bit of foresight i did buy a ps4 copy so that means jake should be able to play it i know will's going to be able to play it i think kyle maybe we can try and figure something out i can i mean i could do it on pc it's not on pc it's, it's not on P it's in the geforce now leak list but it is not um, on PC. It, it's going to be PC. Um, if it doesn't come out on PC before like a month or two, the, the end of the year, I will just get a PS4. Yeah, that's fair. We'll figure play it, it out. Play it at Extra Life. But I'm, I'm yeah, excited yeah. because I, I am a racing fan, so this game was made for me. So I'm excited to hear y'all's takes on it. I, I just, it was, it was kind of this weird roller coaster where this game came out there was so much positive review coverage of it, but it turns out it's because none of the monetization was in the game, and then they turned that on, and the coverage went to shit. 
And then now that I touch it and I don't really care about the monetization and online only does suck, but I don't have a problem with my internet. I'm actually really enjoying it. It's just solid, man. It's just Gran Turismo is such a solid series. I can't wait for you guys to try it out. I'm excited. I mean, you got me. This is literally basically the exact same setup I had for Inscription was you you saying you need to play this game a couple months later yeah or weeks later or whatever it was so it's it's not as it's not as mind-blowing amazing as inscription but man i i've just been doing this thing where like they have like a daily thing where it's like race 26 miles per day and if you do that then you get a little reward ticket and so i've been using that in combination of like the end of the day my work day's over i need to wind down a little bit i'll just sit down and race for like 45 minutes and then it's just like you know it's just like a nice cozy this you know? is th- this is again coming from someone who's never played the series. This is a purely track based game, right? It's like yes. open world. Or, okay. Yeah, right, 100% track based. Track based. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, that's enough about Gran Turismo 7. Let's talk about the news. Let's see if we can get um, Zach in here real quick. Let me. Um... Oh, here he is. the news we're talking about news it's gaming news what's up news oh thanks zach uh he couldn't stick around any longer every week i without fail i think we've been doing it for about 60 episodes now every single week he comes in and sings that live it's fantastic what a guy what a trooper what a guy I've been talking a lot. We've got a lot of news stories here. Which ones would you y'all you you peoples like to talk about first? Well, you and I are saying there's a lot of movie news this week. Should yeah. we? Ch- I think we should chunk that. But should we chunk it now or chunk it later? Up to you guys. I don't know. That's chunk. the only stuff I'm super familiar with from this week's list. Let's save it. Save it for the end. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Let's uh. Let's talk about this Nintendo Switch GBA emulator leak. Uh, so this was kind of interesting. It kind of started leaking piecemeal, but more people looked into it. Um, a long story short, uh, the Nintendo Switch... Nintendo Switch... Uh, how do I put it this way? There's like a Nintendo Switch Online software that you launch to play emulated games that are part of Nintendo Switch Online. A mm-hmm. version of that, as well as some background tools, leaked. And it's crazy. People have gotten it running, and it's literally just the Nintendo Switch Online software, but some later version than what we currently have. Um, and it includes some GBA stuff, uh, including like Pokemon Pinball. Uh, it import. It includes instructions on like how to export to a flash cart, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, you guys see this leak? You guys interested mm-hmm. in anything in I it? I did. I, I saw. I saw it on it. Reddit. Um, people were saying that. Um, um god i can't remember what is the game mother three mother mother three yeah they're they're like (gasps) is it gonna gonna finally get localized yeah so uh i mean i i feel like we say this every time we talk about something nintendo based when it concerns their massive trove of games that they just have that they could release them on on yeah. nintendo switch online or whatever let me have old. them yeah and um this is one of those things where it's like are they actually going to do this where they release a ton of games or is it going to be like the piecemeal kind of way they've been handing sort of yeah i, I don't know i'm i'm always i'm always skeptical when it comes to nintendo because they i feel like they shoot themselves in the foot at the very beginning and then they end up making money anyway so they're like well what do we care so maybe yeah. may, this will probably make a ton of money even like, if it's not like the full complete version that everyone wants exactly yeah so let me let me shout out some of the gba games in here that are in this leak uh you got zelda minish cap uh warrior War inc warrior land 4 tactics ogre super mario brothers 3 pokemon pinball metroid zero fusion and metroid fusion mega man zero three mega man battle network 2 we've got mario golf mario kart that's the gpa mario kart of course Mm -hmm. Uh, mario and luigi we've got both golden suns we've got fire emblem sacred stones f-zero castlevania area of sorrow astro boy drill dozer it's a pretty healthy list i'd be happy with some of these games on here what about you guys i want advance wars that isn't the weird 3d version that they're releasing soon i would rather play the original pixel art one but on my switch um because i can emulate it on my computer but yeah i would like it illegal portable 
same same for me i grew up on that original advanced wars one and this new 3d version just looks like gentrified wars yeah <laughs> it's it's it just, I, I appreciate 3d but i do not appreciate the art style they went with yeah it's just too clean and like i i need i want a little bit of edge um it's and glossy then, and it's smooth it's... what i mean from the games that you listed i would love like I grew up on Metroid Fusion and Metroid Zero Mission, so being able to play those on my Switch would be awesome. Even though, like Jake said, I can relate those using Dolphin or whatever, but still, it'd be nice to like going on the airplane or or a train ride or something. Just bring that up; that'd be sick. Yeah. Also, any of the uh, handheld Pokemon games? Yes, yeah, Sapphire. I'd be crazy about. Mm-hmm. I man, I feel like they would have to pay out the nose to do that, though. Maybe, but how much money would they make? So much money. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's um, let's move on to the next news item. Honestly, this item, I just, I, I am struggling to muster any, anything about this. Uh, there is a new Star Wars game coming from ex Naughty Dog creative Amy Hedick's studio. Uh, Skydance New Media. This is in partnership with Lucasfilms Games, and it is a quote cinematic action adventure game. End quote. Any thoughts on this one? Um, I I like Annie Hennig as far as writing goes. I think she's a very good writer. Um, you don't write Uncharted two and stop being good after that. Uh, I know she has had a lot. Of, I mean, being her dealings with ea over the past like six seven years um she's had a lot of bad luck with getting stuff started and then stopping and being development hell so i'm really hoping that this is her her sort of mainstay in the star wars series um Mm -hmm. i love star wars games i thought um uh what is respawns for fallen order uh, fallen order Um, order? yeah i enjoyed that very much i'm thinking it's going to be along the same lines as that a uh, new character, new part of the universe, maybe not something Jedi focused, maybe more like Bounty Hunter focused, like 13 was supposed to be. Um, I don't know, but I'm excited just because her name is attached to it. So I'm hoping for, if not a, if not a uh, richly uh, varied game, as far as gameplay goes, at least a very rich story that's cinematic. I like those kind of games. I know that, you know, there's some contention among the Subpixel team uh, as to whether or not those games are valid as gameplay experiences or movie experiences. Um, but I, I like Amy Hennig, so I'm at least interested. I was wondering, um, just given her pedigree, you mentioned 1313. I wondered if perhaps this was going to be like, and with this, the at least commercial successes of things like The Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett, if this was going to kind of be a soft reboot of 1313 that um, that because it seems like that would definitely be sense. in that wheelhouse who, yeah who owns 1313 i think it, it was, was lucas, lucas arts was yeah, it not it was lucas arts yeah so oh. disney should own it mm. yeah i don't know i just you know i'm not crazy about uncharted games and since sh- she hasn't really done much honestly since then i'm looking at it so Amy Hennig is, uh, she had Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 3, creative director and writer. Uh, and then she had Uncharted Golden Abyss as a story consultant. I don't even, was that the PSP game? It was the Vita, Vita was, game. Yeah. Uh, she was a writer on Battlefield Hardline. And she was a writer on the new Forspoken. I'm sorry, Forspoken. And... <sighs> That's it. There so, was something that was announced and canceled. I think that was what Kyle was alluding yes, to. It yes, was, there was, was the Visceral. Star Wars game. Yeah, the Visceral yeah. one. Oh, it, I, I was thinking that it was another Star Wars game, but it I was, couldn't yeah. remember. Yeah. Was, I think that's why she hasn't done so much, because she's working on on big project that went nowhere for like two years. Or I know. I, I'm trying not to be too tough, but it's almost just like the things she has done very well are Uncharted, and then she had a lot of promising projects that never saw the light of day. And the thing about promising projects is... They always sound good as ideas and initial work, but it really comes down to does it work in the final product? And without the final product, it's like, yeah, everything's awesome in the planning stage, you know, but I can't really judge you on that. So it's, 
I, I, I think part of this is also that that tagline of what was it a cinematic action adventure game from somebody with an uncharted pedigree. I don't know, man. That just gets me real flaccid because it's like cool. Let's do another a lot of quick time events, etc. I don't know, man. We talked about it. Didn't we talk about it a couple months ago when a lot of the stuff got announced? Like what Star Wars games we actually wanted, what style yeah. Star Wars games? And I just I want Pod Racer Three. Yeah. Yeah, give me Pod Racer 3. I, I, this just feels like this is going to be another generic AAA title that happens to be in the Star Wars universe. And I, uh, I just can't I, get excited. I, I want, I think we talked about that and, and we all had our varying opinions of what we would like and what we think they will do. Um, honestly, I want an open world, open galaxy Star Wars. I want Skyrim, but yeah. Star Wars. Yep. Like that's that's what I want. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just I I want thirty different planets to be able to go to and, and um to be able to build my own sh or get you know, buy my own ship and modify it and um have space back like I want everything. I want I want the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. until I get that, I'm not gonna be one hundred percent satisfied. But I feel like maybe we're getting there, maybe like the next five years someone will announce something like that. Yeah, I I'm so <laughs> I'm I, waiting on Bethesda to be like, we're making a Star Wars game. And Todd yeah. Howard will be like, it'll be great. I um, and then it will just be okay. <laughs> I do think them announcing all these new Star Wars projects recently is them trying to broaden to see what they can do. Um, but I, I think it just really comes down to... So I'll give you an example. Like, we've been playing Hell Let Loose lately. And there's a tangential game to Hell Let Loose called Squad. And both of those games are, like, very multiplayer-heavy mill sim games like mm. like you have to be careful when you're shooting there's like literally a command structure so there's certain actions and there's like a, that you can't access unless you're a squad leader and above and you're doing like a command net and it's realistic if you die it takes you a couple minutes to respawn and then like 10 minutes to get back to the front line mm. there is a mod for that game that is the clone wars so so you're running around as part of the clone wars but in this super realistic milsim tactical like you're calling up the tac net and you're like squad lead squad lead i got the tank spotted 400 meters 20 degrees and it's like these people are there's full servers of people playing this game all the time there's hundreds of people playing that that mod right now and it's like i want ea and lucasarts and any other studio working on a Star Wars game to have the balls to do something like that. I feel like they're just taking like one of the five or six generic game formulas and slapping Star Wars on it. And that's not good enough. Like make something new that also happens to be Star Wars. And that's why I'm finding it hard to get excited about this. This just feels like a typical formula game. I don't know. Am I being too harsh on that? I will say, I will say, even if this has kind of the writing on the wall of being more of a kind of generic templated um, style of game. It's not going to be as formulaic and stupid as the David Cage Star Wars game that's in development. Oh man, I don't think that thing's ever going to come out. I, I don't think it. I will don't either. think it's going to see the light of day. Look, I I hate to disagree with you, but <laughs> I on a whim like got Detroit Beyond Human for five bucks. And somehow I played that entire game. And I think in large part, it's because of how different it is from other games. It's, it's not really what you think. It's not, it's not amazing, but it at least is not like a generic ass game. So I think that with David Cage, it may be a terrible game. There are, odds are that it won't, won't be that great, but I think it will at least be different. That's one of the moves just, they made where I was like, I that's policy. good. Because he's I, an alleged sex yes, pervert. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. The fact that the fact that they said they were struggling to hire developers, like after announcing that yeah. the game was being made, I was like, "Is this game going to happen?" Because they were like, it's "Yeah, maybe going to be in development next year." <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, I I think it just comes back to we want more crazy Star Wars games, or even just go the lazy route. Where's my Republic Commando two? Just do yes. it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Republic Commando Two. Pod Racer Pod Three. Pod Racer Three. Yes. 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 What's yes. Clegg Holdfast been up to? I don't know. Ben Quadrinera. Doug Doug Bolt. What are they doing? Oh man. I could. I was gonna say going. you could bring uh, um, what's his name from Star Citizen? Chris uh, uh, Pratt. Who's the guy? From uh, Mitchell. Yeah, Pratt. Is it Mitchell? <laughs> No, 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 no. It's um, Chris, Chris Roberts. Roberts. Yeah, Chris Roberts, because yeah. he did he did like the X Wing and TIE Fighter stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um bring him 
He's not doing Pottery anything. Thing. What's Cascano? Uh, man, but you know what? Do you guys remember they did a new Rogue Squadron and it wasn't that good? Wait, when did they do new Rogue Squadron? Like a year and a one half, two years ago. They did oh, a new oh, one. Squadron. 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 Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. I was sorry. like, it was Rogue just Squadron? Okay. Squadron? Okay. That was, yeah, Rogue just Squ was basically Rogue Squadron, though. Yeah. And it was okay. like... I get you, I get you. But anyways, um, <laughs> folks, let's talk about Roblox. More news. We got to talk about Roblox oh. here. I cannot believe this story when it came through, but I also 100% understood it and believed it immediately. Um, so apparently, according to Kotaku, quote, on the April 14th episode of the Kardashians, quote, burn them all to the fucking ground, end quote. That's the title of the episode. Kim Kardashian became visibly upset after her son Saint supposedly discovered an in-game advertisement in Roblox that used an image of her crying face. She said the ad was labeled something super inappropriate like Kim's new sex tape. <laughs> I love this so much because that sounds incredible. I'm upset we didn't find that during our 35 plus hours of Roblox content. Oh man. It's, um, have you have you watched the video? No, uh, from no. the from the Kardashians? Yeah. God, it's, no. It's it's, it's one Hulu. of those things where I watched it and my first thought was how did it get to this where I'm watching this video? And this is like an actual <laughs> thing that people are caring about because it's like they're sitting in a kitchen table or like around a kitchen table. And it's like Kim and the other Kims or whatever. I don't know what I their names know. are. Um, and they're like talking about whatever it's it, they all are like they look rich. They're, they look like <sighs> robots. And and the kid is just on the iPad and he's like, look, mommy or something. And and she sees it and she's like what and then she immediately is like no 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 like swipe 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 and then she grabs the ipad and he starts like i think he starts crying or something like that <laughs> and she's like what is this she's like she's like i i saint found this or whatever his name is his name saint yes is saint her saint? and Kanye's kid yeah i, I think, think one of them so yeah you, he her and yees um oh sorry jesus's child <laughs> jesus's child um and it was just like I was like, I was almost like, that's it. But it's just, I don't know. Why, why do we care what these people think? I, um, I love it so much, though, because this is basically a Roblox with friends moment that somehow broke through into the mainstream. <laughs> and I just want to be clear. I'm not accusing them of stealing, but we pioneered the Roblox shot content. OK, <laughs> you cannot take that from us. Oh, my yeah. God. It's that's, it, that's a title you guys are. I think I was just so shocked by this because, like I said, it was it's not shocking to me that she found this in Roblox. It's just shocking to me that like, oh, this is what we did for so long. And now it's just part of the mainstream now is people being like, look at this bonkers thing in Roblox. Oh, boy. Um. Anyways, it's time to talk about the movie block. It, it's all mm -hmm. you, Jake. Which which one of these do you want to talk about first? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's there's so much to talk about because there's so much nuance to each of these. Um, but I think I would want to start with the absolutely bonkers idea of Jason Momoa being in a Minecraft movie. Yeah, yeah, I don't. OK, I'm, I yeah, go ahead and enter this and I'm going to look up the history of the Minecraft movie because I need that. So, yeah, the Minecraft movie was supposed to come out like a month ago. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes, it was very, um, very limited, though. Because it, it, it was announced, like, two years ago. Um, no, more than that. More than that? I think, like, but 2012. They, like, um, Let me look was up. Was it really that long ago? But when was that tweet where they were like, it's coming, here's so, the release date? Originally, it was attached to Sean Levy of uh, Free, Free Guy. Guy. And Rob McElhaney was yes. going to, like, star in it from yeah. Honey. And that was like 2015, 2016, somewhere around. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's just been sort of bouncing around a bunch. Yeah, because and I, I wasn't aware. Thinking? Honestly, I wasn't aware that there was a release date for it that had been like stated. I just yeah. thought that it was sort of in development. So let me let me give the brief breakdown. Um, 
2012, Mojang started receiving offers from Hollywood producers, specifically mm -hmm. for TV shows. Uh, 2014, uh, Notch revealed that Mojang was in talks with Warner Brothers, and by that October, it was in its early days of development. It was scheduled for release five years later in 24th of May 2019, and was going to be directed by Sean Levy and written by Jason Fuchs. Levy later dropped out, but was replaced by Rob McElhenney from It's Always Sunny. In August 2018, McElhenney left the film, and then these other guys came in, and I'm just reading, there's some hot goss in here. <laughs> it initially had a $150 million budget. They that even feels like a that lot. Sounds, they it even, sounds about right, though. They even started early production in 2016, starring Steve Carell. Uh, wait, 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 like, as, like, as so, like somebody started principal photography? Is there was says, a camera rolling? It said early production started on the film, including having had Steve Carell contracted to star. So he didn't he didn't do anything. He was just yeah paperwork yeah him. yeah just paperwork. Um, and then Warner Brothers CEO shuffle. They had a different vision right. for the studio. Uh, according to Michael Haney, it slowly died on the vine, and then he eventually left. 2019, Peter Sullet was announced to write and direct the film. It was supposed to be released in theaters on March 4th, 2022. However, yeah. due to COVID-19, the classic excuse, they removed the film from the film schedule, and I guess it just died. And then the recent news is that it's moving forward with Jared Hess now set to direct and Jason Momoa to star. The film... This is the big one that I wasn't sure about. The film was also confirmed to be live action. Okay. But is it gonna be... So, here's the question, because I've always wondered, you know, what on earth... Do you do something like the Lego movie, where it's where it's animated, and you've got, you know, the big names voicing the characters or whatever, and though it's, you know, it's just Minecraft as an aesthetic... Yeah, and the story is about it's like um, what was the Patton Oswalt Telltale game, Minecraft stories, Minecraft, oh, Minecraft story Origins. mode where you're like, oh, we're friends, Minecraft let's go do these. Mode. Yeah, yeah, is it going to be something like that where it's like a like a traditional fantasy adventure? They go kill the dragon or whatever, and you know you learn something about yourself on the way. But if it's going to be live action, is it going to be like Monster Hunter where it starts in the real world and then they do like a like a like a Space Jam, where they like, juxtapose the I, real photography Jason Momoa I hope so. into the Minecraft world. I, I mean, to be clear, Jared Hess, is uh, his main thing is Napoleon Dynamite. Oh. And Nacho Libre. Yeah, and, and Nacho Libre and Gentleman oh, Broncos. He's a slapstick comedy. Well, I, I wouldn't even call that slapstick comedy. That's just kind of like awkward comedy. It's like offbeat. offbeat. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So, so... I'm actually kind of okay with this now because they have they, they took their balls out, right? They got an offbeat comedy act uh, director and they're doing live action, which is bonkers. Like literally the easiest way is like you said, Minecraft story mode. It's like, we're just going to do an animated movie. We're going to put butts in seats. We're going to have kids going crazy and we're going to license three different pop stars to write original music for Minecraft the movie. Mm -hmm. They're not doing that. They took their balls out. They're doing a live action movie. This is bonkers. This could actually be decent. But at the same time, it, it, Rob McElhenney would have made an incredible one as well. So I I, uh -huh. I would have loved that. They just need to make this movie. I, I'll go see it. I'll go see it. <laughs> I, I Whoever finally like makes Hedges, it. So. And, yeah. and Jason Momoa, is, I mean, I like Jason Momoa. He's, he's very... He's got charisma. Note, but I like that note. I like that note a lot. And um, I, I have... This is just a broad spectrum guess of what this movie is going to be. It's going to start out sort of like Space Jam. But I think... Minecraft is going to slowly encroach upon our world and things are going to start changing. Ooh. Like Minecrafty stuff. And it's like gonna we gotta stop this. Yeah. Until it yeah. breaks. And then we learn that Minecraft is better than real life. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um Kyle, which of the three remaining movies would you like to talk about next? Um, I mean, we can talk about it takes two. Uh, with produced by The Rock, Dwayne the The Rock Johnson, uh, who's legally obligated to be in every movie made. Now. Uh, it is well. I'll just start reading down. Uh, Amazon is going to be developing It Takes Two. Variety has learned. Uh, variety, obviously. Uh, uh, Dwayne Johnson, Danny Garcia, who is his rep, and Hiram Garcia will also produce half of 
seven bucks I is or what studio they are uh um, that's his that's the rock studio it's just called seven bucks yeah he's yeah, got some sort of meaning name. from his life should have yeah. called it like boulder productions or something <laughs> big big bald boulder um quarry production the film, adap- the film adaptation will follow may and cody who as they go through it's basically just yeah the game um okay yeah I, all right that, I that's my reaction this is a very we were talking about mass effect and some other games that are like very easy to adapt to film and uh this is it and it's hard for me to get excited not because i don't think it's going to be good but just because it's like they're not really going to do anything new or interesting with it because the source material it's right there you just got to trans you just got to transcribe it probably cut down some of it because it's not going to be a 10 hour movie like it is the game so yeah i feel like this would be better as like a pixar movie yes or like a disney animation movie yeah like i feel like that would be that would be better but i from what it looks like it's going to be live action what was the one there was a similar or not similar but what was the game that that studio did before it takes two that was also like (sighs) a split screen two player a way out a way a way out a way out out. oh yes yeah that would the, honestly that when i first saw the news for this that game popped into my head before this one of being like oh yeah of course they're adapting that into some sort of yeah. movie that has got the rock in it but you know what I, i'm not excited for this because the rock keeps picking like very vanilla boring projects honestly and he kind of plays the same character in all of them i feel like they should really give this to michelle gondry and make it like like an r-rated Ooh. dark a very emotional <laughs> kitschy looking movie where you're like oh it's a kitschy looking movie and all of a sudden there's just real dark themes running throughout it like there kind of is in the game and i i think again take your balls out and let's make that movie (laughs) uh Uh, you want to do the last one or well i uh well yeah let's let's do some quick hits here so one of them is the um streets of rage film is in the works Actually, you know this what? one made a lot of sense to me when I read the headline. Yeah, let's let's not quick hit this. It's uh, John Wick's Derek Kolstad has scripted an adaptation of Streets of Rage, and yeah, that makes sense. It's a street brawler. Let's get the guy who mm-hmm. who wrote. Uh, I'm sorry, he created the John Wick action franchise. Did he only write it? I think he only did the. First. Did he not direct the first, first one? I'll look it up first. It's... I know he did um, uh, Nobody with uh, Bobby, yeah. Bobby, Bobby O. Ooh. Saul Goodman himself. No, he's just the writer on all of them. He did not. Wait, no, no, no. Uh, uh, Ilya Neschler, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. The director of Hardcore Henry directed Nobody. nobody. Yeah. No, no, no. He, he wrote Nobody. Wrote. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Derek Colston yeah. so wrote I should, both I of them. Have... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he, didn't, he didn't direct any of these. He was just writing them but still i mean he's credited with creating the world of john wick so i i think yeah as long as they pair him up with another really hard-hitting uh unique action director like they have for his other movies then oh yeah this actually could be uh pretty cool mm-hmm. um yeah. well do you guys remember that 80s movie early 90s movie it wasn't streets of rage but it was streets World of Trouble. fury or something it's just like this it's really the- it was it was i i only bring it up just because i always think about it with streets of rage because it was like edgy street kids action movie but it was not streets of rage but Mm. i think there were a lot of those in the 90s yeah i think it's streets of fury it's a really weird cult favorite any number of jackie chan films yeah anyway speaking of cults uh our final story this is just a feel-good story that i happened to peep my eyes on apparently there was a super mario anime movie and uh the only surviving copies uh, originally released in 1986 um it, a lot of tough copies out there like uh, vhs etc there was one person who had a film copy and they had it scanned i think back in like 2016 or something there was a project to resurrect it that project got abandoned another group came along they made a deal with the person who owned the scan and the copy And long story short, they have released, for everybody to watch whenever they want to, a full 4K fully restored copy of the Super Mario anime movie, hand-touched frame by frame. This is a bonker story, right? This is crazy. Great. I'm I'm just, I put the timeline of the movie at like 
two minutes in. Sorry, your mic's cutting in and out. Oh. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I took a, a peek of it as well, and it is pretty bonkers. Um, it's kind of reminds me of the Cobbler and the Thief project, if you guys know about that, where the guy was so obsessed with the, the Ralph Bakshi, I think it was Ralph Bakshi movie. That, that he, yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. That he ended up just going through and restoring it like like frame by frame and having like there are there are still missing scenes where it's just like storyboard picks for 30 seconds <laughs> because they don't have the original art from the movie. Uh, just uh, just a real feel good. I may actually watch this. It looks like it could be a fun time. Yeah. I agree. It just makes me happy that people are have have the the get up and go yeah. to put the, the hard work that obviously goes into this and of course like finding the actual cut uh that they that they used and then doing all the restoration and stuff it's like criterion for free for, mm -hmm. for yeah it's awesome hell yeah well folks i think that's gonna do it for today's episode of local chat uh it's been a fantastic time thank you guys so much for joining us jake any final thoughts and where can people find you uh, I have no final thoughts. My head is empty, but people can find me at underscore Jake Terrio on Twitter. What about you, Kyle? If you're a literary agent, email me. I have a book. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, final thoughts uh, for me is uh, I'm sensing it is now the age of the video game movie adaptation. So if you've got a spec script for like a semi-popular video game series, send it in. Maybe you'll get on the... Uh, uh, out of the hot track to get, the, get that movie made some easy who knows money. who uh, knows who but, knows jake i know your destiny script is gonna is gonna be sent out i'm not sitting on <laughs> it's <laughs> anything <laughs> where can people find you kyle they can find me on twitter instagram at Kyle of the people and you can find us at subpixel team on twitter twitch facebook instagram and twitter you can also find us at subpixelfilms.com where we got all sorts of content we've got a stream coming this weekend thank you guys for watching bye